outside. Great. Welcome to the Houston Maritime Museum. Um, who is here for the first time? Aha. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Well, great. Thank you very much for being here. We're very, very excited. Um, a couple of housekeeping duties that I need to uh, to go through. First, I'm going to pass out this uh, this sign-in form, and this is just because we're a museum and a nonprofit. We have all these rules, and it's just very, very nice. We won't sell your information or give it to QVC or anyone, um, but if you could fill this in so that we have a record of your being here, that's that would be great. So I'm going to pass this around to you all. Uh, I'll start with you. Over. There you go. Oh, just a um, <laughs> and so first of all, well, we'll get back in just a moment to our featured speaker, Peter, but today is Canada Day, and Peter is from Canada, so we decided well, to do that's this. That's right. So anyway, happy Canada Day to all Canadians here tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> A couple of little things uh, for those of you who are have first time here or are not members of the museum. We have membership forms, and we'd love to have you join our our group. We send out a monthly newsletter. We uh, have these fabulous lectures, and um, there are all sorts of benefits associated with being a member of the Houston Maritime Museum. So we hope that you will consider that, and I'll leave them by the door, and you can pick them up on your way out. Um, we have a new gift shop also that just opened. Um, and so if you want to tour that on your way out as well, take a look and see what we've got. Um, and um, this evening, we're very lucky to have, a, we have our, our sponsor, our lecture sponsor, UTC Overseas, and they're here this evening. And uh, Mr. Marco Postler is going to just kind of say a couple of words. And, um, Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, it's, it's a great to be here. On a little personal note, I uh, had the fortune to do my master's degree at SUNY Maritime. If you're ever in New York, I actually did my master's degree in a museum. It's real <laughs> wonderful. And the founder of this museum actually had um, some interaction with the collections uh, upstairs of this museum. Uh, UTC is a global company. We have 55 offices around the world. My speaker here is actually something close to our heart with our activity that we have in Sweden and Finland in Russia and Canada and soon to be Alaska. So thank you for coming tonight and thank you. Great. Well, thank you for being our sponsor. <laughs> Speaking of that, we have our second course is on its way because we ran out of pizza, which is very unusual. That never happens. I guess you all came hungry, but um, we will have, it's on its way. So there'll be a, a, a few more refreshments. I would like now to introduce Tom Johnson, who is a docent with the museum and he is, um, uh, the one that introduced us or introduced me to Peter and uh, was able to, to facilitate this evening's uh, speech. So here we go. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for taking the time to come and visit with us today. Uh, it's my uh, privilege to be a docent and work with the Maritime Museum and particularly to call Peter Noble a friend uh, for many years in the industry. I have a few words to say about the uh, lecture tonight, just the way of background. Uh, first of all, we're all sweating in Houston in the early parts of summer, so it's refreshing to talk about ice for a little bit. Uh, if you picture in your mind, you're going to see some slides that will cool you down in just a little bit, I'm sure. The, the topic, Arctic, uh, Unique Maritime Frontier. If, uh, if we just think about for a minute, the, um, the province of the Arctic uh, years ago was scientific expeditions and the occasional nuclear submarine uh, snooping around under the ice. Uh, the Exxon Manhattan Project, that some of you may or may not have heard about, was an experimental initial icebreaking passage through the Arctic in the Northwest years ago by Exxon. And in the late uh, 70s, there was a, a rush of oil and gas leases and exploration in the Arctic, Chukchi Sea, the Beaufort Sea, etc., uh, which was not particularly fruitful at that time. But when, when the industry had to turn and look at the ice in the Arctic, they started to look around, who knows anything about navigation, marine equipment in the Arctic. And the first thing that came to mind were the Russians, who certainly weren't willing to talk to us about what they knew. The Finns, who knew a lot, but uh, weren't particularly familiar with the, uh, the North American Arctic. And then the Canadians were on the list, and here we have a Canadian who was really a pioneer in this area. Uh, fast forward to today, uh, we have these issues that have developed, as we all know, seasonally. We have some open ice now in the Arctic. Some people say that's global warming. 
That's a debate you can have with your neighbor. Uh, the Northwest Passage is actually a, uh, a transits are being made uh, during the summer periodically. Uh, Peter may speak to that a little bit. The um, renewed interest of the global uh, oil and gas uh, that may be in those areas and we're planning some more lease sales and possible Arctic activity by the oil and gas industry. And the international strategic issues surrounding the fact that now that we think we can navigate in the Arctic, everybody who's got their toe in the water up there wants to express their sovereign claim to the territories. Uh, we'll talk about that. that. That's the reason that we have this topic tonight. But let's talk about Peter for just a minute. University of Glasgow, naval architect. Uh, early stages of his career, Arctech Group, uh, he was the president in Canada, uh, obviously from the name, a ICE-oriented marine and naval architectural group. Kaverner Massa, vice president, chief operating officer. The American Bureau of Shipping, vice president of engineering, very prestigious position to occupy with their working headquarters right here in Houston. Conoco Phillips, chief naval architect, chief party technical. Uh, person on staff and after retirement about a year and seven months ago Noble Associates where he is the president recently in Russia I don't know if he can talk to us about what he was doing in Russia uh, and he is, the, he is the president of the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers uh, of the United States and indeed, and indeed the worldwide presence. Uh, unique in his personality is that he is a committed uh, to the education of the youth and the general population in this industry, and that makes him a very colorful and special speaker. So without further ado, Peter. Thank you. I could have tried to live up that billet, but that was very impressive. So uh, we need to get this function at or something here to help me get this up on the screen. I'll go find you some help. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> it's on the screen here, but it's not showing the time here. Just a second, we'll have techni technicians on the way. Okay. After that introduction, I thought you could do anything. <laughs> I can walk on water as long as it's frozen. That's what I'm <laughs> Let me just, while we're waiting for that, I'll explain a little bit. The, the Arctic is, is really a fascinating part of the world, and it's really largely unexplored, which is one reason that um, it's interesting, because we, there's a lot we don't know about the Arctic, and probably more we don't know than we do know. But the Arctic is not homogeneous. Uh, we think of, in one way, you can define the Arctic by the Arctic Circle. Uh, but the Arctic, the waters north of Norway, for example, are almost rice-free. Whereas compared to Newfoundland, which I was in last week, and I'll show you a couple of pictures, which is far south of the Arctic Circle, and there's icebergs everywhere. So the Arctic, I would define as a place from a neighbor Arctic or mariner's point of view, a place where there's multi-year ice present at least some of the year. Multi-year ice is ice that doesn't melt in the summertime. So the Great Lakes, the Baltic, have seasonal ice. There's ice and there's no ice. The ice goes away every year. The Arctic typically has ice all of the year, some of the time, in some parts. So that distinguishes the two, and that gives some extra challenges. Uh, Peter, if you, we'll have somebody here in just a minute. One of the young ladies who's our technician went to get the pizza. <laughs> but, uh, uh, is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> you think you might be able to? We have, we have a, a young lady here who thinks that she can help you straighten that out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Seven or function eight, but I don't know. I just want to get to this. No. Signal Hill, where Marconi received the first transatlantic wireless message back in the early 1900s. So it's a narrow thing. And right out there is, is an iceberg park. And uh, 
I put it up there because it's a neat shot, but it's also important, and it's a little bit of an Arctic. What the part of the iceberg you see is a small part. And that's, I'm going to give you that part of the Arctic today. There's a lot more I'm not going to cover. The iceberg is under the water, so I just think about that when, we're, when we go ahead here. I'm going to go back. Um, a lot of this is my personal story, but a lot of it goes back beyond that. And, and I really believe that we need to understand where we come from in order to know where we are and where we're going. And this, there's a bunch of quotes. I collect quotes. And the first one, the, the Santana one, that you know, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. That's kind of old, old style. I, George Bernard Shaw had a better one, which said, we learn from history that we don't learn from history. We actually keep making those same mistakes, and we see that over and over. But the one I like best is Mark Twain that says, history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. <laughs> you go around, but you don't come back to where you were, you come, but you see a pattern there. And, and patterns are very important in life, so just keep that in mind as we look at things. Um, I'll make a video of this. Okay. Okay. If we go way back in, into the Arctic, we, we think of, of a humankind and populating the globe. The Arctic is actually very recent. If you look at the out of Africa 200,000, 150,000 years ago, moving into Europe and Asia in 50,000 years ago, typically the Arctic wasn't populated until maybe 15 to 7,000 years ago. So it's relatively new. And because of that, and most people that moved across the land bridge into Alaska headed south. So there's a relatively thin population of relatively uh, new Arctic residents. And that contributes to our uh, excitement, I feel, when you go there. There's a lot of stuff we don't know because people haven't been there that long. One of the other things, just to go back in time, geopolitics of the 15th century, back in in the day uh, when basically Portugal and Spain were attempting to rule the world, the Pope, Pope Alexander VI, decided that he would settle things by drawing a line somewhere down the middle of the Atlantic and say, this site's Portugal, this site's Spain. Now there's bits left over, but we see even today in South America, the reason Brazil is Portuguese and the rest of South America is, is Hispanic is because of that, that thing. What, what that did was it didn't completely settle the Span Spanish-Portugal deal, but it really upset the Dutch and the English and the others in Northern Europe <laughs> who, were, who were blocked from getting to, to the, the Spice Islands and, and China. So that's what started the search for the Northwest Passage. And I'll talk up quite a bit about the Northwest Passage because it's one of the, the sort of fabled things that really, even today, is an important part of what we look at. So let's talk about it. And, and this is really Northwest Passages, not the Northwest Passage. So the, the, from the fifth, late 15th century onwards, there have been explorers looking for a way to, to get from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and basically seeing the prize of the, the Spice Islands of China as from a merchant point of view. So it really was driven by, by a commercial incentive. And I would say that most of the time, that's where discovery comes from. People aren't discovering, aren't looking for science. They're looking for some commercial gain at the end of the day, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that drives a lot. Even today, we'll talk about that in terms of, of resource exploitation and, and in the Arctic. There's a lot of attempts to get through the, the islands. Now, Canada has this archipelago that actually makes it quite difficult to navigate. And the, if we look at the middle of the ocean, I'll talk about that, and, and the, the northern sea route, which goes along the Russian coast, it's actually probably easier to navigate that. But the Northwest Passage, which actually goes, it, it defined in different ways, but as a Canadian, Canada tends to think of the Northwest Passage as being a Canadian passage. It's not. There's at least part of it is in Alaska, because it's, you're not out of the Northwest Passage until you either cross the Arctic Circle in the, in the Chukchi Sea or you exit the Bering Strait. It's really connecting the Pacific with the Atlantic. And there's a lot of geopolitics even today. Canada claims that the Northwest Passage is not an international strait, it's, it's internal waters. And that gives them different control under the law of the sea. The US, we claim it's international waters. And uh, actually not so much from the Canadian point of view, but if we give up the claim to, into, to international waters or international straits, there's things like the Strait of Ormuz and other places that have much more significant geopolitical concerns. But anyway, people have been trying to get through there, and the names are still there. We see Cabot, we see Baffin, uh, Hearn, Kane Basin, McClintock Strait. So a lot of the names that you look at, the geography is defined, is actually from a lot of these early explorers. The first ship to actually transit the Northwest Passage was, uh, was the Hioa. 
which uh, on Sunday I hope to be in Oslo to visit her. She's still on display there. But rather recently, it wasn't until the early 1900s, 1903 to 1906. The Norwegians claim this is the first voyage to the Northwest Passage, but as a Canadian, I don't think it counts as a voyage if you stop and overwinter three times. So I'll cut my I think a voyage is when you start and you sail all the way and you finish. That's a voyage. This is a transit, but it's not a voyage. So we'll let the Norwegians claim that in, in 1903 to 1906. The ship overwintered uh, two winters in Joachim, halfway there, Haven, and then another winter at Herschel Island and it arrived in San Francisco when the earthquake happened in 1906. And so a lot of the success in this was submerged by the other activities of that year. One of the other things, and the first, the first time that I touched the Arctic with a personal relationship, there was another expedition, which actually the same year that Shackleton went south, there was a Canadian expedition left uh, Victoria to sail into the Arctic to uh, a voyage of discovery because a large part of the Arctic islands were undiscovered at the time. In fact, they were the only land masses in the planet that had not been discovered in the early 1900s. And there was an explorer called Stephenson that set off in a pretty ill-prepared uh, voyage that ended up with, with no success at all and a lot of death. And, and the contrast is interesting because Stephenson actually abandoned the ship and, and people died but he was successful in the expedition that he discovered new land. Shackleton, on the other hand, if you remember, totally lost the mission. He lost the ship. He didn't lose a single man. He sailed the, the small ship to uh, Elephant Island and then on to South Georgia. And the contrast between the two are quite interesting. I, I encourage you to study that in terms of polar explorers. But the Carlook was, was a ship that sailed into the Arctic, tried to get round Alaska to, uh, to the, uh, let me show you here, uh, basically, left uh, Alaska, sailed to Herschel Island, and then the red line is the ship was, was uh, drifting. It got stuck north of Wrangell Island, the large green island, a small speck called, called Herald Island. Some people went to Herald Island, they all died. The ones at Wrangell Island spent at least one year there. And then a fellow called Captain Bob Bartlett, who was a Newfoundland ice master, crossed the ice to Siberia and traveled all the way along the Siberian coast and over to Alaska, and then got a ship and went back and picked up the survivors who we see here. My connection is, the, the little guy poking out from behind there, Willie McKinley, was a, an old gentleman when I met him as a teenager. And he knew that I was Canadian, and he said, oh, I'd been in Canada a long time ago, and I didn't know any of the story until I read it later. He, he was very modest about it. He was a high school teacher in Scotland. And then just to, to round out the story, uh, this is not quite focused, can we? Everyone else <laughs> so the, the bottom I can see it. Yeah, good. The bottom corner is again me and Newfoundland last week at a place called Brigus, and Brigus was the home of Captain Bob Bob Barker. He was also the ice captain that took Peary on his voyage to the North Pole. So he's a pretty famous guy and, and a uh, good Canadian. So I playing up the Canadian stuff for a uh, Well, he may not have been a Canadian because Newfoundland only joined Canada in 1949, so he was a Newfoundlander. Probably. The first voyage, voyage through the Northwest Passage wasn't until 1944, 70 years ago. And that was a non-stop voyage, 86 days from Halifax, Nova Scotia to Victoria. And it was with a vessel called the St. Rock. It was built in Vancouver and was, was a ship for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police who were about the only government entity that actually spent any time in the Arctic in those days. She's still on display in Vancouver Museum, and actually one of, I have a connection there too, because the very first job I had when I graduated was to design a strut to hold the stern up. Because as you know, old wooden ships, when they're out of the water, they kind of uh, they sag down at the ends, and they said, design something that holds it up but doesn't get in the way of people seeing it. And I haven't been back, but I think it's still there. So there's a connection. The St. Rock is, is worth a visit in Vancouver. The interesting thing too that I didn't find out until quite recently, this of course was during the Second World War, and it was odd to send a ship through the Arctic at that time. But the plan apparently was, and it's, it's been documented, that the Canadians were ready to invade Greenland because to deny the, the Germans, Denmark had already fallen, and the, the German U-boats and the weather forecasting service were using Danish islands. And the Sinop was sent through there to actually be the communications vessel with along with the 250 soldiers that were supposed to go from Canada. 
by the time they got there and sorted things out, that threat had diminished greatly. So they sailed back in a single voyage. So I, I claim it's a Canadian ship, built, built ship with a Canadian captain that actually had the first voyage who announced this passage. What's more important is it's quite recent. I mean, 70 years ago in the time span of American history is pretty recent. Do you mind if you I don't mind at all. Yeah, great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We don't want to miss a word. Okay. Okay. Well, I thought I'd get to come back. And that's <laughs> oh, you can do that anyway. <laughs> Shall we hear? Okay. Does it go on this way? Where'd you go? Oh, this way. Yes. Uh, question for you. Oh. Where's all of them? Where's all of them? Young ladies and gentlemen, this is great. <laughs> okay. Okay. No. <laughs> what is that? Like a blue box? <laughs> Testing. the Manhattan and the Manhattan was a very important thing. If you recall back in the mid 60s oil was discovered in, uh, in the North Slope although oil was actually discovered by whalers around the late 1800s. The, the whaling industry out in New Bedford and other ports actually had eventually made its way into the Pacific and at that time I always claimed that the oil industry saved the whales because it was actually discovering shale, shale oil in Pennsylvania that stopped us whaling. But in the late 1800s, there was quite a lot of whaling going on in the, the Chukchi and Bering Seas. And there are records that I've read where the, the whalers went ashore looking for water and they looked at little lakes and they found black lakes full of sticky stuff with dead caribou in it, right where we're, we're actually producing oil now in the North Slope. So the, the oil in the North has been known a long time, it just wasn't known it was commercially exploitable. About, about the mid 60s, we started to look at that. And this is before we had the pipeline, so there was a trade-off. And, and Humble Oil, now, now Exxon, had a very ambitious project, and it's hard to see that people would do this today, but they spent a ton of money to take a brand new tanker, cut it apart, and make it a nice worthy ship, and actually sail it to the Northwest Passage, all the way to Point Barrow. One of the reports I was rereading in preparing this says that in fact Sun Shipbuilding in, uh, in Pennsylvania, where they did the conversion, they actually paid the shipyard and the ship owners they paid the ship owners to stop worrying about it and wait uh, six months while they took all the labor force to work on their project. It's hard to envisage that today, but that's, that's what they did. So in 1969, they voyaged through the Northwest Passage, by far the biggest ship. This wasn't a small sailing ship, it was a major tanker, and made a successful voyage in the company of a, a couple of Canadian icebreakers. The, the U.S. government said, that they weren't going to ask permission, but Humble Oil thought better of it and asked the Canadians to help, and in both ways it was, it was successful. From a naval arctics point of view, it was a successful voyage, but the pipeliners won out and said, we'll build a pipeline that's a more reliable system, and it's cheaper. The pipeline went something like 4,000% over budget, so who knows what the outcome would have been if they got it. <laughs> I, I did a lot of work on the Manhattan. I wasn't on the voyage itself, but in analyzing data later. But one of the reasons that I wasn't involved with the voyage is that my wife and I, my bride of one year, went to the Northwest Territories and built our own Arctic vessel. We built a, a, bar, a barge, uh, about a 120 ton barge, and a small steel tug in Hay River on the south shore of Great Slave Lake, and sailed 1,100 miles down to the Arctic Ocean. I, I can't believe my wife I made her do that, but she enjoyed it at the time. She's never done it again. But next week we're going to Norway and we're going to take a ferry trip to the Arctic. So that's her reward 50 years on. But one of the things we, that's interesting in the rivers, and the same in, in Russia, 
you know, we tend to talk about up north in, in the things in, in our normal lexicography, but in the in the north they talk about down north because you go downstream. So you're going down north when you when you navigate to the Arctic Ocean. I've seen the same thing in Russia. They go down north because the major rivers flow north to, into the ocean. Actually, the tug and barge there was the, was driven by the same things that we saw uh, Exxon with the North Slope. There was just the beginnings of seismic activity and oil exploration, and that's what, what that was supporting. In the 1970s, we probably saw the zenith of commercial ice breaking happening in the middle and late, so I'll talk a little about that. In the mid-70s, the Canadian government had a, an interesting incentive plan that basically wanted to encourage oil exploration, and basically they were at a tax plan that went something like, if you spend a dollar, we'll give you a dollar fifteen back. So it was pretty easy to make massive expend expenditure at that time with government support. The first icebreakers, uh, icebreaking supply boats, looked a lot like supply boats you'd have seen at the time here in the Gulf of Mexico, above the waterline at least. And below the waterline, they looked like a lot like a, a, a Baltic icebreaker. So they really just put the two together and, and said, off you go. And actually, they worked remarkably well for that. Most of the problems were not with the hull, but actually with the machinery. Because when you break the ice and start feeding it into propellers and shafting, that gives you a lot of challenges. So along came, in the late 70s, a, what turned out to be a real game changer. And this ship was designed, called the Kagoriak. It was built in St. John, uh, St. John, New Brunswick in pretty short order, with a lot of different features for a heavy iceberg. It had ice reamers, basically elbows that stuck out beyond the side of the ship so the channel was broken wider and, and you didn't nip the ship. It had a, uh, a, a bow flush system so that as heavy ice was pushed under the hull, on, in the Arctic you get a lot of snow on the top and that's sticky, so if you could lubricate that surface that helped it slide by. You had an ice knife at the bottom that allowed that ice to be diverted and, and in lots of cases actually pushed up under the surrounding ice that wasn't fed back in the propellers. So a lot of interesting things. Uh, the bottom picture shows it, it's a, you, you see that picture a lot. It is one thing we found out with, with this kind of icebreaker which is in a backing and ramming mode. So you, you design ships in the Arctic typically to try and go continuously if you can and maybe six feet of ice if you can. Uh, but once you get below about three knots, you basically have to stop and back and ram. And so you see here the, the ship down there. One of the things we found out from experimentation was when we, when we did backing and ramming, the ship would run into the ice and push the bow up in the air. But like most offshore supply boats, have rather low transom. Now the stern wave was still traveling at 12 knots when the ship stopped. So it started to run up the beach of this thing and then run back down and leave about four inches of ice on deck. And you do that a few times and suddenly your stern's underwater. So we had to be careful about those kind of things. The other thing we found is, you know, the cuddly picture of the polar bear and two cubs that you see on the picture <coughs> postcards is not like that in the Arctic. The polar bear is a predator and you and I look like a good meal to a polar bear. And <laughs> they can smell bacon frying, you know, from 10 miles away. There are always bears around. And low freeboard ships, they're easy to come aboard. Lots of times we've got bears on board ships and it's a really dangerous thing to have. So just keep that in mind. So here's some of, just some of the features. The, the reamer system, the ice knife, the box keel. And actually this is a, it was a game changer. We'll see in some future pictures, a lot of, of modern icebreakers have used some of these features going forward. <coughs> At the same time as Dome Patrol, which was the lead, there was another company, Gulf Canada. Um, both of them have gone away now, but in the early, late 70s, early 80s, they were going gangbusters. Uh, Gulf took on the challenge and, and built even more ships, and there's four <coughs> of them there. They're all still in service. Three of them are in service under Russian flag, and one of them became a Canadian Coast Guard uh, cutter. Connection here. The very first drill ship in the Arctic was called the Canmar Explorer, and she was converted here to Todd Shipyards at Galveston in 77 or so. Uh, she joined uh, three other ships. Only one was originally a drill ship, the others were all cargo ships with various things that were converted into drill ships. And they, they drilled successfully in the Arctic for several years, even in quite uh, heavy ice conditions with ice management. So, using the icebreakers to keep things stirred up, they could stay on late in the season. And, uh, and, and they would winter over, they would not leave the Arctic. There's lots of places in the Arctic where you can actually operate a drilling season or something else, but you can't actually get there and get out in the same season. So a lot of times we develop systems for actually leaving a the ship there cold. And you go down to minus 55 and you come back in the spring and work up the systems so you can get back in service for, for another season. 
a rather unique uh, drilling unit, which is a circular drill barge, and some of you will remember this is the unit that Shell managed to lose the toe on and end up in the rocks two years ago now, I guess. Uh, but it was quite successful. It was terrible in open water. Round things aren't very good in, uh, as ships. But it worked quite well in the ice because it didn't matter which direction the ice came from. The ice tends to move around with the tides. So you never know which weather's coming in the bow or not. But that, that unit is now being cut up in China right now. It was built in the early, early uh, 80s and served quite well for quite a few years. Then it was parked for a few years at Rochelle and then reactivated by Shell. The other side is the government, of course, operates a number of ice breakers. So we'll start with the Canadian Coast Guard. They've had a, uh, and like a lot of government things, they tend to do something and then leave it alone for a long, long time. So the Canadian Coast Guard heavy icebreaker, the only polar icebreaker, was built in 1969. She's a rather old lady now, and I'll show you a picture of what they think they're going to build a replacement, maybe delivered by 22, or which I, I'll be surprised if it's delivered in 22. Anyway, so this is a bunch of old ships. They are class icebreakers. The Canadians have a, have a need for a lot of ice breaking on the St. Lawrence Seaway. There's a lot of commercial traffic, so that's the primary use of those ships. They're also used in the Arctic in the summer season. Uh, this is the, the, the proposed Diefenbaker, named after one of the Prime Ministers of Canada. This will be the new ship. I always think it's, it's actually very unlucky to call a ship by its name before it's up. As a shipbuilder, we always call the ship by its hull number until it's christened. So I, I think this is a doomed project. <laughs> Not only because of that, but that doesn't help at all. Uh, it's already grown from 750 million to 1.2 billion in about four years. And, you know, it's a long way off. So it'll, it'll be a challenge when governments talk of long-term multi-year projects, but the government will last three or four years. It's always, we all, we all know what happens there. <laughs> Uh, and we've been through the cycle actually before this there was a Polar 6 in the 70s, there was a Polar 8, there's the Diefenbaker, you can see the transition. They've all been paper ships and unfortunately this may still be a paper ship. We're not much better off in the US. <coughs> we have one large Coast Guard iceberg, the Healy, built in the 90s at Avondale. It's owned and operated by the Coast Guard but totally under the control of the National Science Foundation. So it doesn't support any kind of uh, commercial or icebreaking activities, it's a science ship, in fact it spends most of its time supporting the Antarctic program. We have two other icebreakers built in the 70s based out of Seattle, Polar Sea, Polar Star. Interesting ships, but only one of them runs at a time because the other one provides spare parts for the first one. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they, they are ships that have interesting, they have gas turbines on board which gives a lot of power. In fact, they're a fairly light ship, which is not good. You want a heavy ship with power. Uh, the other problem is they've got about enough fuel to run the gas turbines for two days before they run out. So <laughs> you've got to be careful of those ships. And there's talk now, uh, the US government is taking an interest in the Arctic again, at least in words, and talking, the Coast Guard have said, yeah, we'll get some money to do things, but we're, we're years, if not decades, away from actually replenishing that fleet unless something, something else happens. The Russians, on the other hand, have, been, have a mature system. They have a large number of uh, nuclear-powered ships which can operate year-round without refueling. Uh, they have a, a boat, they have non-nuclear icebreaker support, generally shallower draft that go into the rivers, and they have commercial year-round activities in their Arctic. They also have a very mature administration system for escort, escorting ships in and out called the Northern Sea Route, which publishes rules and regulations and publishes scales of fees that you pay them to go in and out of that. And we'll talk a little later about, about our trans-Arctic shipping. And I was talking to somebody earlier, the Russians are very smart. I mean, they're encouraging it right now, but it's like the Suez Canal. You've got to pay tolls. And if you save 300,000 in fuel, guess what your toll's going to be? Probably $50 less than that, because they could judge. It's not based on how much it costs to operate the, the canal or the transit. It's how much you're willing to pay to not go the other way. Same in the Suez Canal. The same, exactly the same. Nordic countries, uh, particularly Sweden and Finland, have icebreaker issues, mostly because of the Baltic, and, and uh, Finland over the years has now developed to be, to all their ports are year-round ports, that wasn't the case before, so they've got a lot of need for export of ore and forest products, they do that on a year-round basis, even in the northern part of the Baltic, and they've developed special ships for that, very powerful ships. Ships that are powerful enough that you don't want to just leave them idle come Easter time when the ice goes away and wait till next December. So they've developed multi-purpose ships that basically we've used them in Alaska and other places to support offshore 
activity. Not perfect, but uh, they've at least given some capabilities. But of course, you've got to be careful how you use a foreign icebreaker in U.S. waters because of the Jones Act. Uh, ice breaking is not a Jones Act trade, but if you put anything on or anybody on and take it off again, you're going to be in Jones Act trade. So it, it means you can use them, but only for very limited purposes. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what's happening now. And, and we talked, just mentioned the geopolitics. The Arctic, unlike the Antarctic, is governed by a treaty. Everyone signed up to in the late 50s. We divided up and say we'll all play by the rules and it'll be. You know, New Zealand claims this and Britain claims that, but we'll just kind of put that aside. We'll have no commercial <coughs> exploitation. Arctic is different. The Arctic is, there's no land mass at the North Pole. The land mass is all pretty well defined. There's a few little specks of rock between Greenland and Canada that may be in dispute, but there's no serious land dispute. And because when the land is defined, the marine boundaries are generally defined. We have a 12 mile territorial sea and we have a 200 mile economic zone. So there's not very much, uh, except right in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, that would be considered commons, and it would be considered commons uh, just as any other part of the ocean is, once you go below the economic zone. When, and, and there's a little quirk to that, because the law of the sea and UN has said, if you can show that geologically the land mass under the ground is connected to you, then you can actually start to claim an extension. So there's a little bit of a land grab going on there, the Russians have been doing uh, submarine testing to say that geology is ours, the Canadians say no, it comes from our side too, so we'll see. <laughs> the important thing is that there's nothing in the middle of the Arctic Ocean that envy wants commercially. And as I said, a lot of the reason we've done the Northwest Passage about is because of a commercial imperative. If you look at the, the dark blue, that's where the oil and gas is likely to be. And it's all inside somebody's defined territory. So there's not much real need to go anywhere else but in t inside a defined zone. Getting in and out of those areas it may be an issue in terms of who claims rights of passage across them, but, but they actually where things are are generally pretty settled. So there really is not a lot of scope for territorial disputes in the Arctic today. Just this map blown up again. The darker the blue, the more likely there are, are uh, hydrocarbons. So we can see, just to frame it up, that's Greenland sort of pointing up to the northeast there. So we've got Canada and, and Alaska coming down on the, the right-hand side, sort of from 2 o'clock down to 6 o'clock. And you can see these different places, and, and all of them have had some drilling, and, and it looks like there are hydrocarbons in all of the areas. And then on the Russian side, you can see all the way from the Barents Sea all the way around, in fact, all the way to the Russian Chukchi Sea, it's a huge area, and it has a lot of dark blue stuff. So they, they are sitting on a lot of hydrocarbons. Not easy to get to, and they've been lagging behind some of the technology, but they're picking up fast. And as you've seen, a lot of the, the international companies, the Exxons and the BPs, are very active with the Russian partners right now. <coughs> when you go to drill in the, in, in the Gulf of Mexico, you basically have a higher rate, and you, from one company, you hire a couple of supply boats, and you've got a, a base at Como or somewhere else, and you basically operate. You go in the Arctic, none of that exists, so you have to put a fleet together. And this is just a partial fleet that Shell was using in the Chuck GC. I think they had 27 vessels, and the 27 vessels would be mobilized, go, go and support the rigs. They haven't drilled a well there yet. They spent $5 billion and haven't drilled a well, haven't finished a well. This is an expensive business. And uh, when you can see, you've got, to, you've got to take your own fuel supply, you need a tanker, because there's no filling stations up there, there are no shore bases. The Arctic in most places is very shallow. If you find a port, it might have three meters draft in it, so you can put a barge in, but you can't put a deep sea ship. And so you, there's a lot of offshore sea basing and transfer, moving people around. The Arctic in the summertime is very foggy, so flying helicopters is a challenge. So if you've got a crew that you want to rotate out, how do you do that? If they're you know, their time is up, but they can't get a helicopter out. There's a lot of issues around that. And you're far enough offshore, you can't fly all the time the whole way. So people are at the intermediate staging points for locals. And and at the bottom, ever present our friends at Greenpeace or some other <laughs> environmental thing that, it's funny, but it's not. It's dangerous what they do some of the time. And certainly, I think the oil companies have to, have to be good stewards of what they do, and they haven't always been. But sometimes, if there's real interference with it, that doesn't help it. It actually causes more issues. But it's something we all need to work on together. <coughs> One of the things that's actually been the, the biggest, and it kind of goes below the, the radar, is, is a uh, mineral resource exploitation. The Arctic is, is a huge store of mineral resources. 
These are all lead zinc mines, large lead zinc mines. I didn't show it on there because it's actually it, it, it did show up on the map, but it, uh, just north of the Bering Strait at Red Dog is a mine that's actually owned by the local native corporation and it's the world's largest lead zinc mine. It produces 1.2 million tons of concentrate a year that they ship out in the season. One advantage of hard rock mining, particularly in the Arctic, is you can ship during an open water season because you can store. If you're producing oil and gas, you have to have a continuous shipping model. It's very difficult to store those products and get it to market. But lead zinc ore, you can store it for six or eight months and then ship it in four months. That works economically. So we've seen a lot of that. One of the things too that, like, like oil fields, uh, ore bodies tend to have a finite life. So for example, the Polaris that I worked on, which is a far north mine, uh, that went into service in the early 80s and 22 years later was taken out of service, the ore body was depleted and the whole thing was put back to the way it was before. The, the uh, little side story there, a lot of the issues of course in the Arctic are to do with regulation and permitting and I actually uh, was working with the, the mining company and they went up to the Resolute, which is the nearest community, about I don't know, five, six hundred people for hearings in the license. And there were five of us went. And the only questions the natives had said they were interested in having jobs, but where the mine was, it was going to fly in from where they were, <coughs> is could they bring their hunting gear because it was close to polar bear hunting? And the mining company said, well, only if we take charge of the rifles and put them in a blockhouse, but after you're off, that's fine. Nice quick pro quo. A month later, I was working another project, which was a large LNG project, Petro Canada, the national government. I think there were 27 lawyers on the team. We spent a month up there and made no progress. So part of, part of what the mining companies are much more acceptable in the north. The northerners see mining as a, as a normal part of their business. They see oil companies as threatening to them. So that's just part of life that we have to deal with. These, these are all ships that operate. Uh, the, the ones down in Boise Bay are interested. It's a large uh, nickel mine as well, exported to Europe. But they operate year round, and there are places in, in they're up one of the long fjords where the, the natives actually use the fjord ice to get about. And so when the ship plows up and down, it kind of dug a hole across the highway. So they come up with an innovative system where they hire the local native corporation and they have a pontoon bridge. And so they announce when they're going to be there, they give the GPS coordinates, they move the ship through, they lay the bridge so everybody knows where it is, and everyone's got. They're, they're traditional hunters, but they all got cell phones with GPS on them. And so they know where the bridge is, and they know when it's open, and that works very well. And there's a lot of these things in the north where people have worked together with pretty creative and innovative solutions. Uh, Russia, again, has year-round shipping. Uh, two that I'm familiar with and have worked on. Norris, again, a large nickel mine. There's a lot of nickel in the Arctic, uh, on the Yenisei River, and they come out, Novia Zemnia, the sort of banana-shaped isle. Uh, they sometimes come through the Kara Sea and out the Kara Gate. The Kara Gate at the bottom of Zemnia is the beginning of the Northern Sea Route. So on this, on the Varent Sea side, it's not under the Northern Administration. On the other side, it is. And they sail out to uh, Murmansk. Varende, which is a project that Conoco, I work with Conoco on, is actually an oil export, year-round oil export. Oil is onshore, but the terminal is offshore. You see down the lower part and we built three ice-breaking tankers that are independent ice-breaking tankers break up to five feet of ice and they've been doing that continuously since 2008. Let's look at the trans-shipping, transpolar shipping. There's a lot of things in the press about the Arctic ice going away and we'll have ships sailing across the Arctic uh, Ocean. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon for several reasons. I don't think the ice is going away quite as fast as people have predicted, and I'll show some of the reasons why I think that. But also, uh, the, the, you see one thing, the Northwest Passage is not an easy way if you want to go from, from Shanghai to Antwerp or to Rotterdam. You're much better to go either the Russian side or, best of all, go straight up the middle. And there are people who have done that for a few voyages. The problems with things other than ore cargoes and other things is that when a, when a uh, container ship comes into port, the port has to be ready for that. The berth has to be ready, the, the uh, offloading equipment, the trains all have to be timed out. If you're two or three days late, you've screwed everything up. And the Arctic just isn't well enough defined to know that you can arrive in port on a certain time ahead of time. And even if you can do it a few days of the year, it's not going to be a continuous operation. So most of the serious Container shipping lines have not looked at that. 
some of the companies looking at coal shipments and other things, there was one, one coal vessel came from Vancouver to Rotterdam last year through the Northwest Passage successfully. Uh, but it was it was lucky, it wasn't caught with anything, and I don't think it really was much of a commercial thing. They saved some money on fuel, but they could have got stuck and not saved any money at all. So you need to think about that. Uh, let me just talk a little about conditions. We hear a lot about it, and one of the things, since 1979, we've actually good satellite coverage of the Arctic. So up until 79, any data we have is pretty suspect. Even in 79, we were starting at data that was largely visual oriented. So when it's foggy, which it is in the summertime, or dark, which is in the wintertime, we didn't have real good data. Today we have. We've got good data. We've got a SAR, a synthetic aperture radar that can see through fog and darkness and really define the ice. So our ability to know what's happening in the Arctic has improved dramatically just in the last few years. But let's look at the last three years. You can probably see on here a small purple line. That defines the median extent of ice for the last, since 79, I believe. And, and that's the actual winter condition. So you can see there isn't much change in the wintertime ice. It's a lot of ice everywhere. There is some change in thickness, but not everywhere. So the ice is ever present in March. March is generally the heaviest ice, because that's when you've had most of the winter to accumulate ice. We look at the summertime, and we see a different picture. You can see maybe the purple line again. In 2012, was the end of a, a rapidly diminishing summer ice condition. And we see that all the time in the press. In 2013, I haven't seen it yet, but there was 50% more ice in the summer in 2013 than there was in 2012. That trend was reversed. We don't know about this year, 2014, but it could go either way. Mother Nature, it doesn't respond to scientific computer models very well, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. There's a lot we don't know about the Arctic, and, and we'll see. The ice comes and goes. A lot of what we've seen is actually not ice melting in the Arctic, but ice actually being flushed out of the Arctic. And when you take ice that's maybe five-year-old ice and dump it into the North, North Atlantic, it takes five years for new ice to become old ice. So I think we're going to see much longer cycles than we've been able to measure. But we'll see. In any event, it's pretty hard to see how ships will operate through, through that on a continuous basis. The other thing is that when you get light ice, sometimes it ends up where you don't want it. In 2012, for example, I was working with Conoco on drilling in the Chukchi Sea. And in August, you don't see it there, but in August there was ice sitting right on the drill site, which was very unusual because that was ice that had been further north that had drifted, loosened itself and drifted. So it's not always just less ice on a global scale doesn't mean to say it's better for a particular operation. And that's something to keep in mind too. What we are seeing increases is what I call Arctic destination shipping. So rather than transporter shipping, it's coming in and out of the Arctic. We, we see oil and gas, the green, there's activity both in the Western Arctic and the Eastern Arctic, which tend to be somewhat separate. The Western Arctic is access from the Pacific, Seattle, Vancouver, uh, Eastern Arctic out of, uh, out of the Nova Scotia or even Europe. And they tend to be separate. They, they, don't, quite, they don't really overlap much. Uh, we see logistics. They, there's a number of small Arctic communities that need fuel, need resupplies, and that's usually marine supply. So you see them scattered around, generally small villages, you know, less than a thousand people, but they need, they need uh, resupplies. Mineral development, we talked about, there's a lot of that, both equipment to support the mining and fuel and then export the concentrates. And a growing part, which is kind of tricky, is the adventure cruising. Now we see adventure cruising in small, <coughs> Uh, somewhat ice-worthy craft, maybe two to five hundred passengers aboard, usually somewhat geriatric, maybe with a couple of gin and tonics, and if you hit an iceberg in that, that's probably not going to be a pretty outcome. The other part is there's crazy guys in kayaks and sailing canoes and all kinds of things go up there, and there's still a need, you know, people, one of the things, if I want to do that adventure, I think I should be able to do it, but I don't expect someone to rescue me. That's actually not how things work, unfortunately. So we still have an obligation to look after these people, even who do dumb things. And there is no search and rescue capability in the Arctic. Um, we have something called the Arctic Council that was just instituted a few years ago, which is the circumpolar Arctic nations have come together, and they've started to make treaties, and they've made a treaty on search and rescue which on paper looks great, they'll cooperate, but the fact is there's no assets there. You can fly over and say, oh, there's somebody who's rescued, but you can't actually get to them if they're in the middle of Baffin Bay. So we've got work to do there. On the, on the other side of the thing, there's some ambitious projects that the Russians have. There's a lot of gas in the Arctic, and they've signed a deal for a pipeline to China to bring 
a lot of gas in, but they're also looking at, at LNG, liquefying the gas and taking a ship. Uh, they're sensible enough to say it's not year-round operation to the Arctic. They'll do summer voyages out to the Bering Strait to China, and they'll do winter voyages to Europe and, and export. I think their export is somewhat ambitious. If you look at the green countries like China and India as importers, there's a lot of gas much closer to them than Russian gas in, in the Middle East. And things. things can happen in the Middle East that make that difficult, but it's going to be challenging uh, to make these projects work. But, but LNG is, has some big advantages. One of the projects I'm working on is looking at some Arctic icebreakers using LNG, because fuel is a huge issue in the Arctic. Whatever it costs you for a gallon down here is probably five times that by the time you transport it to the Arctic. And there's also issues on, on uh, burning diesel and, and the particulates and, and emissions. So the, the Finns actually for their domestic icebreaker for the Baltic are, are now building an LNG powered icebreaker. And one of the things I'm looking at in this project is actually to have a LNG plant in the Arctic with Arctic gas to fuel Arctic, both Arctic ships and Arctic communities. Ice-breaking LNG ships for Yamaha there. Conoco Phillips actually has operated the only LNG export facility in the U.S. since 1969 with ice-strengthened LNG ships sailing out of Cook Inlet, Alaska. So there is some experience in barge-mounted plants. There's a lot of activity in both hydrocarbon and mining where we don't want to build all the equipment in the Arctic. We build it in southern places and then bring it into the to the Arctic by towing it on a barge. So we're nearly done. Big issues are in the environment. The environment is not that fragile, um, but it's quite robust in some areas. But whatever it is, we have no right to destroy it. And the environment includes the people that live there. So we have to be sensitive to that. It's one of the top priorities. One of the big problems we have, particularly in the offshore business and particularly in the Arctic, is what we at Connor were calling the big crew change. There's, there's a few guys my age and Tom's age now that have been around in offshore and, and some other things for a lot of years. But we had this big gap in, 19, in the mid-1980s when the Arctic stuff stopped, when the oil press went south. And when it started to come back was probably the late 90s, by which time all the young kids were seeing dot-com boom. They were not talking heavy engineering. And so probably was another five years before we actually got people back in. So there's a 20-year gap there that still exists. And at Conoco, I was doing a lot of work on filling that, and we were making some steps. The problem is that we had the demand curve that looked sort of like a normal bell curve, and we had this double hump dromedary of actual age distribution. The problem, as we evened that out, the demand curve doubled. So we were actually haven't done a lot of sex. There's a lot of activity in the north that we need to fill in. Transport. In the north, you know, we have we have got transport infrastructure kind of go together, and, and they're the biggest concern. The north has ice, it has darkness, everything else, but probably the lack of in infrastructure is the biggest hurdle to actually developing this. We know how to handle the ice. You know, we can light up the darkness, we can we can handle cold weather with right materials and right clothing, but just just be far away from everything. It, it puts a whole burden on things. You can't come home and get a spare part. If you don't have enough fuel, it's not waiting a day to get more fuel, it's waiting a season sometimes. So you need to work on that, we all do. And then energy. The, the, the uh, dichotomy is the Arctic is very rich in energy, but we import all the energy we use to do anything in the Arctic. So there's, there's a kind of disconnect there we need to work on. And just a little damn thing. One of the, maybe I'll come back sometime. One of my, my spare time, I, I'm a naval architect by profession, but I'm a boat nut from way back in Sula. Indigenous naval architecture is one of the things. The, the local people in the north have a fantastic indigenous craft to build these things. This is a, a umiak, which they use for whale hunting in Alaska, which is still done, although they do use outboard motors. And, and we were tracking whales by putting GPS trackers on to know where the whales were. So they, the hunters like that a lot. They, <laughs> in fact, some of you have seen the, the traditional uh, Western Alaska blanket toss, where people gather around and throw, throw a young kid up in the air. That was actually to look for whales. There are no trees to climb, so you hit the long, young guy with good eyesight and threw it up. And hopefully, he didn't call out the whales till he was back safely in the blanket, so they didn't all run for that. <laughs> but they use these boats, and these boats. I was taking some pictures one day, none of this of another in Wainwright, Alaska, which is way up in the far northwest. And this older guy came over and start, we started talking, and it was his boat. And we had a good conversation, and then I would say, well, what about the, the boat didn't have a skin on it, because they take the skin off in the wintertime. I said, what about the skin? He said, well, I've got 
bearded seal skin for this one and we roll it up and keep it in the warmth. But we really like to use walrus skin, but it has to be female walrus. About this time I'm thinking he's pulling my leg, you know, I see so, but I play along, I say, oh, why? And he had figured it out, male walrus have big tusks and they fight, so the skin gets scarred. Mm -hmm. And any of you know anything about membrane technology, if you try to tension a scarred tissue, it'll rip. Well, these guys had figured it all out without ever going to engineering school. <laughs> and so they found the female skins of the right size and strength, and that's a female skin boat right there. Okay, that's enough for me tonight. Thank you. are nuclear powered, 75,000, and they're building at least one new nuclear power ship. They built the first nuclear powered surface ship in 56, the Lennon. She's been retired now, but their main heavy icebreaker fleet, probably six or seven active icebreakers are nuclear powered. And, and it's a successful use of nuclear power. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, you didn't address the you're talking about FPSO development in the Arctic. Do you think maybe that's because it's, it's, it isn't being done uh, recently, but do you think it will be technical feasible in the nearby future? Or? No. Mostly because most of the places people are looking for oil are in shallow water. The Arctic is mostly shallow water. Most of the places around the Arctic where we're looking in, in uh, offshore Alaska, Chukchi Sea, maximum water depth is 40 meters, 140 feet. It's rather shallow for any kind of floating system, either for drilling or for production. Uh, same in Russia, by far 85% of their, of their continent shelf is less than 50 meters. So I think it'll be, we'll see the places that are in the Arctic, like the Barents Sea, which is deep water and doesn't have much ice. That'll be an FPSO province. But so far that hasn't seen a lot of exploration. The places where people are fairly confident to get oil and gas are relatively shallow water. <coughs> And, and there's a lot of work to look. The trade-off is difficult because generally the water is too deep to actually build artificial islands, which is one way to do it, and too shallow to use a moored drill ship. And so I think the first developments will be on the exploration side. We still have to find oil before we get to the production site. But I think FPSOs and ICE are still some way off. There are just not many places that lend themselves technically in terms of water depth or amount of ice to those areas. There'll be a few, I mean, we're seeing a lot of FPSOs off Newfoundland, which have very light ice and dodge icebergs once in a while, they have to disconnect. That kind of, we'll see that there, but not in most of the other Arctic, at least in the, for the time being. So it's not, it's not a short term solution. Uh, yes, I saw a special, the other, earlier this week about that Russian, combination tanker icebreaker thing right and they were saying they were going to their oil well up in the heart and they were breaking the ice with their, like normally with the front right and then they said the ice got so thick that they had to turn around and break it with the back now, right. how did they break it with the back with its blunt well they didn't it's, get it's not hard it's <laughs> well it, it's uh, there are some special designs which basically are called double acting ships uh, the ones we use at Garden Day are, the double acting ship has actually got an open water bow and an ice breaking stern. The ones we've used in the Arctic had ice breaking bows and ice breaking sterns. The, the stern of the ship, it's not blunt. It, because you don't break the ice this way, you break the ice this way. And actually, the st I, I was on an ice breaker, a really old ice breaker, on the Canadian coast well, back in the 60s. And we got stuck in the ice. And it had a steam reciprocating engine in it, that's how old it was. And the master turned the ship around and sailed backwards. Well, if you think of old ships, this thing had a traditional kind of stem bow on it, but the, it had a cruiser stern. And this cruiser stern was low, uh, low bowling. It was perfect for breaking the ice down. Not only that, the propellers actually help because the propeller creates wash that actually, as the ice is broken, it pulls it away and lubricates the hull. So that's quite a normal thing today to operate going, going astern in the ice. Mm. And that particularly with with potted drives, which have become very common. So you actually have an azimuthing drive, so you can actually control the ship well. 
The interesting thing on the Wolf, which was the ship I was on, when we got out of the ice and turned around to go to Halifax, the ship kept turning to port. Because when we got there, we found the rudder had been permanently bent about 30 degrees to one side. So you've got to watch the, when you're going to start an ice, you've got to watch the rudder. Yeah, well, thanks, so. Yeah. The question here? Um, I think probably most of the people here understand the oil industry, but I, I like to see how things are made. So could you describe a, a ship, an ice breaking ship, a hull? Yeah. The bow got to be full of a lot of lead. Well, no, typically typically icebreaker hulls would be about two inches thick and, and a grillage inside, so that, that would be the thing. And that's, that is adequate for icebreaking. The one challenge we have in, in the north, and most of the damage is not done in the ice, it's done in open water with iceberg fragments. So there, because generally when you're in the ice you have a controlled speed and you're paying attention. When you get out of the ice and you're heading for Antwerp, you're saying, gee, I'll put up to 12 knots and you've got stormy seas and that one room size piece of ice that's almost a wash, that's the thing that gets you. And, but we deal with that through subdivision. So there are from time to time iceberg collisions. It's no worse than running into a submerged container that happens once in a while. It does some damage, but you can localize that. You're not gonna sink the ship. It's not a Titanic type event. So the hulls, the hulls are typically um, maximum two inch, two and a half inch thick steel with proper welding behind it. The welding is really important because the, the ice abrades the whole hull all the time. So the normal protection you have on there, some special paint, but a lot that gets wiped off. And so as you get corrosion, the ice wipes it off. And so you're in a normal ship, the rust will actually start to, a little bit of protection for future rusting. That doesn't happen in the Arctic. So you've got high corrosion rates you have to pay attention to. The other thing is the whole machinery component. I've seen more ships stuck on the ice because they couldn't get cooling water into a sea chest. So normally a ship draws water into the hull into a, through a grillage and then pumps out through the engine to cool it off. When you cool cold water, not frozen water, cold water in, quite often the velocity actually turns into a slurpy mix and then you can't get through the engine and your power goes down and then you're really stuck. So you have special things to look at how to handle the sea chest. The whole machinery issue is also a problem with the propeller loads on ice. There's some special things you need to worry about there, shafting, bearings and things. But it's it's fairly well understood how to how to design systems that can operate in year round in, in the Arctic. It just takes a lot of money. Can I excuse sir? Can I yeah. ask a half question? Okay. It's the kind of break both ways and you just have to bring the propellers way in and Design about well, the propellers actually no. The 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 ASI part propellers, the potted drives. If I'm going this way, the propellers in the front end. And when I go astern, they're actually. So I'm now I'm backwards. You swing the propellers. The propellers are actually the first thing that the ice would see. But the ice is up here because it's sloping this way. So the propeller was here, be close to the ice. Because the propeller's out there, it's not close to the ice. So the ice breaks. So the propeller's clear of that, and so it can give clear. Not every time, there are ice bits hang down, so you need to make strong enough, but generally you get pretty good flow by doing that. But the propellers are tractor propellers on the pod, so on the front end of the pod to pull you forward, which is just a giant trolling motor. I mean, it's an electric motor and a big propeller hanging below the hull. Thank you, thank you yes, sir. Uh, I trust the, the main uh, thing behind that <coughs> ship is that you circulate the cooling water internally, avoiding that you suck in the ice. That's one way to do it, yeah. And, and quite often they'll have that, you recirculate some of that to keep it warm enough that doesn't happen. Yeah. Or you may have a compressed air blow down on it, and sometimes you build the ice chest with a dam in it, so the, the ice comes in on one side, but it, the water can flow over and that stays out. So there are techniques exactly mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. Way at the back. No, it does not exist. It's planned now. It is. I think it's it's being funded, but that's the plan to develop that that LNG. Is that a Russian endeavor? Yes. Yeah. And how do they anticipate addressing issues like crew change? Will that also give the region more fuel to work from and with, as opposed to having to bring in? Not Yamal. Yamal has a lot of natural gas. I think there are five. 48-inch pipelines come out of Yamal to Europe right now, so they're not short of energy, and, and there's very few people there. So I, I, I don't really know what they use. It. I'm sure they use natural gas for local fuel, but that's all for export. And so it's a trade-off between natural gas is 
today not not a great business to be in. It's pretty low price, but uh, if you use a pipeline, you can put it in one end and take it out the other. So you have fixed. LNG gives you some flexibility. It's more to produce. But when I put in a ship, I can take it to China, I can take it to Britain, I can bring it here. So there's always these trade-offs. If I got a lot of gas, I'd probably like a bit of flexibility in how I would export that. So that's one of the, the YAML things. I think if you looked at a standalone, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you've already got all the pipelines in place, discounting the ones that go through Ukraine, because you've got to put some around that now, but they're working that too. Then the LNG gives you another way to get some gas to market. What about being able to utilize more LNG vessels up there? Yeah, I mean, this, I, I can't remember, this will be probably a dozen new LNG ships to service that thing, so there will, there will be things. Again, it's going to take a little bit of time for that market to develop, because the old style LNG business was like the one we had at Conoco, you signed a 30-year contract with uh, the Japanese, and you had a fixed delivery, and you could finance the whole thing. Today, that's not as common to be able to sell the whole output, so you could sell 30% of it, and you have to, you have, the Chinese come in as your partner, but they don't necessarily bring money, and then you've got to find a market for the already haven't pre-sold. So it, it's more complex today than it's been in the past. Is there a question here? Well, you know, when I think of ships, I always think of the U.S. being pretty superior in almost every category. But you tell me we have very few icebreakers, and they're old. Are they assigned to the Coast Guard or the Navy or the commercial? The Navy doesn't have any icebreaker ships, although recently the Navy has realized that it's not if but when they have to go in the Arctic, and they have no capability right now. Uh, there are three polar icebreakers. The Healy, which is the newest, was built in '95. And she is a Coast Guard cutter, but she is funded by the National Science Foundation. So the, the Coast Guard really have no independent mission for that. So she does science missions, mostly to the Antarctic, some to the Arctic. Uh, and there are the Polar Sea and Polar Star, the two other Coast Guard polar icebreakers are in Seattle. They're built in the 70s and basically haven't been funded to the degree to keep both operational. And there is a plan for the Coast Guard. They've got a little bit of budget to look at the new polar icebreaker. But generally, when you build a polar icebreaker, building one like the Canadian Prozzi is not a good idea. You can't really do anything with a single ship. You really need a pair of ships. That's a minimum, I believe. If they make a new one, would it be nuclear? Or, or no. no. I'm going to have to uh, say that should be the last question. This gentleman's traveled a long way, as you've heard, and he's got more travels uh, to like I do, today. but I, you can, I love talking about what I do. So <laughs> if any of you want to catch me either, like I say a little while here, or uh, you can have my email, I'll be happy to answer any questions I can. Now I want to say one thing in closing. This, this presentation tonight, which we dearly appreciate, uh, Peter, coming here, is uh, first, it's sort of experimental. It's technical in nature as opposed to historic, which some of the other lectures have been. We'd like to believe that we do have an audience in the future for more technical issues, such as the LNG industry, perhaps. It gets a lot of press. But uh, I, I like to see the hands in the audience for people who would vote for more, some more technical things like this in the future. Uh, that's very encouraging. We, we, we look forward to trying to put programs together for you. Peter, thank you so very much. I want you to come back.